to a wonderful start this morning. I am absolutely delighted to be hosting this next session with my wonderful panelists. We've got an amazing lineup of experts, um, practitioners, uh, leaders of cities uh, to join us for this conversation about the role of cities in the clean cooking challenge and really how cities can lead the way on clean cooking. Um, as we know, of course, more than half of the world's population lives in cities and urban areas are engines of economic growth and innovation, but also huge carbon emitters, contributors to pollution and consumer of consumers of resources as well. And so we're gonna dive deep into how cities can really um, champion our important kind of global climate ambitions, but also uh, this critical uh, clean cooking challenge that we're all gathered here today to discuss. Um, and to introduce myself briefly, my name is Helen Watts. Uh, I'm the Senior Director of Global Partnerships at Student Energy, a youth-led global organization working to accelerate the sustainable and equitable energy transition by empowering young people. So I'll give a little bit of an intro and then get right into the conversation. We have lots to share and discuss today, so we'll, we'll leave as much time to hear from our, our wonderful experts. Um, and then if we do have time, we'll go into a little bit of Q&A, uh, but likely very brief, so maybe kind of start thinking of your questions now. So empowering cities to lead clean cooking transitions um, that best suit the needs of their citizens is absolutely essential to improving health, the environment, and climate. Municipal energy, climate, and develop development plans should be integrating clean cooking needs um, that clearly create an enabling environment for the clean cooking sector to provide affordable and accessible solutions. Um, I will briefly introduce uh, my panelists here and then I'll ask them to, uh, to speak in maybe one sentence a little bit about their work and then get into some questions. So I'm so delighted to introduce the Honorable Elizabeth Nakwatso Tawiyasaki, the Mayor of Accra, who has joined us here today and is also hosting us in her, her wonderful city. Um, we have Kweku Korenteng as well, um, or sorry, Abdul Karim Mara, who is the Development and Planning Officer at Freetown City Council. We have Kweku Korenteng, the Clean Energy and Climate Resilience Officer at ICLE. Um, and we also have Mercy Rose, the Program Director at Energy for Impact, and Ni Darko, the City Lead and Coordinator of WRI Africa. Um, so maybe initially, I'll actually pose it to you, um, Mayor Saki. So Honorable Mayor, thank you again so much for hosting the forum in your wonderful city and for the leadership that Ghana and Accra have demonstrated on clean cooking. So Accra, I know, has quite an ambitious climate plan. Uh, could you share a little bit about the highlights and maybe explain the role of clean cooking uh, that, that clean cooking plays in a cross climate plan. Thank you very much, Pat. Let's give you the mic. Thank you very much. Uh, and then my question, I have to just let you know that um, I'm in an area where my people over there are all into fishmongering. And then uh, we have something we call kinky. I don't know whether you've tried it, but I think it would be nice to try it. And this is a craft for you. And then they usually will cook kinky to sell and then do some bankung. The Ghanaians here understand what I mean by bankun. I will soon after this program will serve her some to just have a taste of, and I, I'm sure you are all ready to also taste it. This is a crowd for you. So we have a bankun also, and usually all these things are done by putting firewoods or charcoal to be um, poked and then sell. But with this clean cooking, which we know that uh, it does with uh, LPG gas, and then uh, the, in order not to pollute the air, and we need clean air to live on, I think that that's the main reason why I'm here th this morning to support the clean cooking program and also to enhance everybody to be part of it, and then I'm very sure that that will help our climate also in order that to we'll have a very clean air to breathe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Mayor. Um, and delighted to pass it over maybe to Abdul to kind of share a little bit about your work. So Freetown, of course, has been a leading municipal voice on clean cooking. 
and set forth quite an ambitious program on it as well. Um, could you speak a little bit to the work that you're doing with, uh, with the city of Freetown? Good, good morning. Um, for some of you who don't know Freetown, Freetown is the capital city of Sierra Leone. It has a population of about 1 million and generates about 30% of the country's GDP. Cooking in Sierra Leone is largely characterized by the use of charcoal and firewood, where 64.7% of the household uses firewood and 32.1% uses charcoal. In Freetown, most urban residences use charcoal. Freetown City Council is now championing an initiative called Freetown the Tree Town. The objective is to plant one million trees. This includes planting of trees in schools, planting of trees in communities, but to make the process easier, we are establishing what we call distribution centers, where people would collect trees, and these trees involved economic trees and other type of trees, because we believe if we plant economic trees, it will help people to get fruits as well as protect the environment. However, we understand that the impacts of the Transform Freetown campaign can be greatly diminished with the continuous daily level of deforestation to provide firewood to meet demand. Because of that, we have put in place few programs. As I'm speaking, we are working with the INACT project, and we've also put together developing the first climate action strategy and setting up of a unit at the Freetown City Council dedicated to climate action and disaster risk management. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so we've heard directly from two cities that are very much laying out these ambitious plans and commitments um, to address the clean cooking challenge and our twinned climate challenge as well. Um, we'll then move on to Kwiku, actually. I want to hear a little bit more about what ICLEI is doing. Um, so ICLEI, of course, is a network of cities. Um, I know that ICLEI has been working with cities across the continent to accelerate the clean energy transition. So high, how high is clean cooking on municipal climate and energy agendas? Can you speak a little bit more to that? Um, so it's, it's, ICLEI stands for um, International Council for Local Government Environment Initiative. But we often don't want to call ourselves by that because we've outgrown that particular role. Um, ICLEI as an organization is building capacity of cities across the world um, to build, to integrate um, sustainable development program and resilient programs within urban planning and city um, designs. Um, in ICLEI Africa, um, we've identified a number of cities across the continent that we are working with on a number of interventions. Um, ICLEI's membership actually spans across over 150 countries across the continent. Um, to now deal, uh, drill down to the subject in terms of clean cooking and how municipal integrated planning programs actually have some level of um, low carbon emission programs um, directed at clean cooking. Um, across the continent, there isn't a lot, unfortunately. Um, those programs are often found at the national level um, and it's, um, it's more of uh, an emerging area for municipalities now beginning to rethink and refocus on how to actually integrate um, um, programs and policies to support um, clean cooking solutions at the local government level, or local government uh, um, um, acts and programs. Um, what ICLEI has been doing um, is been working or building um, relationship with the cities um, through various programs. Um, the ENACT program is one of the programs. It's actually enabling energy access to transform African cities. And um, that's the full title of ENACT. And we've selected um, Freetown and Kampala 
as the leading cities to actually embed this particular intervention and programs on. Um, we are not just working with cities, but we are working with the most marginalized group of people within the city space or city landscape. So we work in, in informal settlements. Um, informal settlements are, are, are settlements that often are described based on their low income status. And the interesting dynamics here is that it, when you examine African cities, African cities are gradually evolving to become more informal cities than formal cities in terms of urban structures, in terms of income levels. So when designing solutions, and one of the very important questions I've been asking myself throughout this whole um, forum is clean cooking for who? That's the first and most important question we need to actually try and address. Because most of us in this room, I believe we already have access, but the people who really need the solutions are not even in the space to even contribute in shaping the kind of conversations that we are having. So it's important for us to reflect carefully what we mean by clean cooking and if for who and for what, which group and category of people. I don't want to take the excitement of this particular session. I'll give um, um, the microphone over to my colleague to add a bit more to it. But it's something that I want to leave everyone here. If we are talking about clean cooking, who are we talking, which group of people are we identifying? Is the models that we are introducing feasible? Does it capture in the various um, community-led ideas into the business models um, that could actually make sense for the communities that really need them? And these are the conversations that I want us to have. I want us to live here and try Kenke. I want us to live here and try the fish that the mayor is actually talking about with the banku and all that. But if you understand how these foods are prepared, it will help you to reflect carefully on what clean cooking actually means for the most marginalized groups in most cities across Africa. Thank you. I think I'm, oh, there we go, wonderful. Yeah, thank you so much. And there was a really interesting session yesterday um, on actually really putting kind of the consumer and the person first and thinking about, when we're thinking about solutions, are we really engaging directly with communities, talking to people, understanding um, how, how people are really engaging with this issue firsthand. And so I think it's a really, really important point that you brought up. And um, we'll go right on to Mercy, because I, I really want to hear Mercy a little bit more about energy for impact. And I know that last year, um, Energy for Impact and Mercy Corps actually merged to accelerate access to climate smart, sustainable energy, um, and is improving the lives of millions around the world. So why are Energy for Impact and Mercy Corps focusing so heavily on clean cooking? Can you speak a little bit more to your work on that? Thank you, Helen. Um, can I just first of all check if you all can hear me okay? Yeah? Great. Perfect. Um, I'm not going to delve too much into the merger between um, Energy for Impact and Mercy Corps. I'm just going to say that it was a strategic decision that positions us to do what we're doing at a much larger scale and deliver impact to the people that need it the most. Um, but if you want to learn more about it, please, um, you can find me later after this session. So I'm gonna start, so why clean cooking, um, you ask? Um, I'll look at it from two perspectives. One, the, uh, the potential, and two, the problem. So I'm gonna just switch it a little. Uh, and uh, the potential here is that, clean, uh, that cooking and food are a fundamental part of our lives. We interact with food on a daily basis. It, it affects us individually, socially, culturally. But the way it affects us um, differs depending on our own vulnerabilities to other um, risks around us. Um, I'll give you a good example. So for example, um, clean cooking reduces um, the cost and time that it takes for people to cook and it makes it easier for us to then, um, it makes cooking enjoyable, yeah? But for low income or low resource um, communities, this then translates to an opportunity for them to pursue other productive, um, productive activities. And in urban spaces, we're actually starting to see, and I'm gr glad to hear from Madam Mayor here that people are using cooking to earn income. And 
that then ultimately leads to um, them improving their resilience to other you know, vulnerabilities such as economic shocks. Uh, we all know what is happening now with the fuel crisis, which has a cascading effect on food and, um, and commodity prices. But then being able to save just that little um, allows them to ride this wave in a relatively easier way. Um, another, another thing is on um, women and gender, right? So clean cooking allows for, um, you know, uh, the, for women to, the reduction on the, uh, the burden of unpaid care work for women and girls. Um, and what does that mean? So we've seen, um, you know, programs such as the Modern Energy Cooking Services programs uh, bringing in, making it easier and cheaper to cook with electricity, for example. And we're seeing the conversation shifting now and uh, men also being involved in that you know, in cooking, and we are also seeing women gaining a voice in decision making at household level because they're much more empowered now. And it's all because of cooking. So there are um, lots to think about in that aspect. So when we talk about sustainable development, I believe that clean cooking should definitely be at the heart of this. It starts with that simple act of cooking, but it has a much more confounding eff uh, effect on sustainable development. Wonderful, thank you so much, Marcy. And I think that gender nexus component is so critical. Um, next, I would love to hear a little bit, Ni, I know that you're working with WR Af WRI Africa with um, CCA in particular on quite a bit of work around clean cooking and cities. Um, would love to hear a little bit more about your work and kind of your experience as somebody who I know has quite an extensive background working on cities as well. Um, where do you think that kind of linkage between clean cookings and cities really exists and how are you working with the Clean Cooking Alliance to accelerate that work? Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Um, so um, WRI's contribution towards this um, energy sector conversation really comes in with our collaboration with um, CCA, that is Clean Cooking Alliance, where we partnered to, to develop the, clue in the Clean Cooking Explorer. I mean, this is based on our, um, um, our energy access explorer, which we developed measuring the access levels of indigenous communities as well as cities to energy. So based on this technology or this um, platform that was developed together with CCA, we've developed the Clean Cooking Explorer, which was pioneered in, in Nepal. Um, it has the opportunity for scalability and it could help measure access to clean cooking um, appliances within the city space. So for this um, innovation, other business partners or energy experts or people in the energy space who are promoting their clean cooking um, and, um, products could rely on this platform to help assess where there's um, easy energy for them to introduce these things. So based on the Clean Cooking Explorer, you could see where people have access to LPG, electricity, et cetera. So when you're introducing these appliances, you know where to go to. Um, this is a, a nice way of helping promote clean cooking across the world or in urban centers. So that's one of the work we do. Also, we have um, a program called uh, AFRI 100. AFRI 100 is helping communities restore degraded lands, okay? But we realize that in the peri-urban areas, most of these um, communities rely on wood lots or fuel wood from wood lots around these communities. So I believe if you're able to collaborate well, based on this, we're providing funds for community-based organizations to do the restoration. But then if you're not able to come up with alternative sources of cooking, alternative means of cooking, they will still go back to these woodlots or these um, reserves that we have around the peri-urban area. So if we are able to collaborate well at the CCA and the BRI, we could target these communities and also make access um, available funds to them to enable them also, I mean, get alternative sources of cooking, alternative methods of cooking, and then they could protect these woodlots that we have around the peri-urban areas. Thank you. 
Wonderful, thank you so much, Nee. And again, kind of bringing it back to this idea of really working directly with communities to really understand the consumer, the, the people who are actually, who are actually cooking um, themselves in their homes and really designing solutions around, around that specifically. Um, we'll bring it back uh, to you, Honorable Mayor, and I mean, we're so lucky to have you here with us in this discussion while we're being hosted in your city as well. And I would love to hear more from you on um, really what are the challenges with all of the challenges facing local and national governments today. And we, we don't talk very enough, I think, about the role of local governments and kind of the agility that comes from being so connected to people on the ground. Um, why, why do you feel that cities should really be prioritizing clean cooking? Thank you so much. I think that, yes, as I started with looking at my area, and therefore I think that clean cooking is a vital component of climate challenge interventions and essential in achieving the sustainable development goal 3, 7, 9, 11, 13, and 15. We are very much aware of climate change as a global phenomenon and its effects on people and the environment, as well as the urgent attention or action to take by all countries through the attainment of the SDGs. Humans cannot survive without um, safe environment and that's um, why heads of, department, heads of states, organizations, and in individuals have exhibited much more interested in climate mitigation and interventions. So globally, we know of 2.4 billion people dying. And then uh, we also see that all this comes from unclean cooking. And for that reason, we're thinking of uh, coming to adapt the clean cooking system. We can tell that using of fuel like uh, kerosene and others are not healthy enough for the body and also for our health as such. So there is a need for us to all uh, adapt or be part of the clean, uh, clean cooking project. And I think that this clean cooking project will help us to have a clean air and there will no be much pollution and also the negative health impact that we have. We should be sure that all these things are cleared from the system. Cancer, pneumonia, and so many other diseases. And for that reason, I think that we we'll welcome home the clean cooking project. We have uh, enough actual, and with, uh, actually, I personally am very passionate about women and children. And looking at cooking, it's always women and children who do that art. And then therefore, the impact of the uh, air pollution and then the emission of gases and others affect the health of the woman mostly. And therefore, there's the need for me as a woman, as a mother, to fight this phenomenon. And therefore, I think that uh, cities are the center of climate change uh, with a high population concentration it's positioned uh, so we have to lead the clean cooking. And clean cooking, cooking solution will intensely reduce health issues associated with the issue of unclean cooking energies, protect lives, improve air quality, and harmonize the environment. So climate change has the tendency to bring the, to the world or to halt, hence, any relevant and achievable uh, interventions, particularly clean cooking initiatives, must have a priority to all relevant stakeholders. So I endorse that. Thank you so much, Honorable Mayor.
It's a really important kind of call to action and message of leadership on the role of cities, and, and we really appreciate you really centering clean cooking in, in a cross leadership on, on this challenge. Um, I would love to take it back, Abdul, to you, and I know we were talking a little bit yesterday about kind of the unique nature of kind of Freetown and um, how, as a city, there, there are complexities to really consider in, in achieving the clean cooking challenge. And I wonder if you want to elaborate a little bit more on kind of the unique nature of working with a city directly on the clean cooking challenge, why that's different than kind of some of these national conversations that we often hear about in addressing the challenge. Thank you very much. You see, for me, maybe in the West African sub-region, when we talk about local governance, in most cases, it's like it is in principle. But practicalizing this has been a very serious challenge to us. Because if we want to address problems, the local councils are more closer to the people. So there is an interface between the people and the local councils. In our own case in Freetown, of course, after the 11 year rebel war, it was clear that for us to enhance effective service delivery, functions should be devolved to local councils. There was a local government act saying that these functions should be devolved. But interestingly, we don't have the adequate opportunity to implement these functions. And there are some of these functions who are not even devolved. They are in the rec book, record books that they should be devolved, but they have not yet been devolved. One of such is devolving um, this type of function, energy-related issues. I'm not saying that they should be completely devolved, but devolving some of those aspects will help to implement or to address those problems effectively. Because functions of such nature have not been devolved, we are still grappling with the issue of maybe taking the center stage in energy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Abdullah. Um, and Kweku, uh, I would love to hear a little bit from you as well on kind of some of these barriers and, and we're kind of getting into the challenges now. We'll kind of come back into solutions and, and end on a hopeful note for sure, but a little bit more on kind of what are some of the barriers that cities are facing um, from, from what you see in your work in promoting clean cooking to their populations. Um, thank you. Thank you for the, the, the opportunity to actually highlight. I mean, the problems are well known and well documented across. Um, there's not sufficient statistics that actually point to the issues of clean cooking and all that. But in terms of the local governance level, um, the issue, uh, this, this some of the issues bother on financing. Um, um, that's one. Also, you also have limited capacity, um, non-existence of, of policies to be able to guide some of these particular initiatives. So even when NGOs, international NGOs like us want to even build on such interventions um, on clean cooking. Um, the city councils often don't have the requisite one, human resource. Um, you, we have to draw on national government. And the bureaucratic processes of actually getting these entities together, local government talking to national government, it's always a challenge. Financing, it becomes a challenge in terms of where do you place the financing? Do you place the financing at the local, le local governance level, or do you place the financing at the national level, which goes through, I mean, and it has its own auditing processes. Um, but there's a lot of expression from a number of local governments wanting to build quite extensive capacity around issues of um, energy, energy transition. Um, a classic case in point is with South African municipalities um, that have actually been given the mandate of having their own local um, 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 local energy policy, electricity policies. And it's, it's more or less like the major source of revenue. So what it means is that instead of having last mile distribution companies um, providing meet, um, metered services, it's the municipalities that actually do this. And they are the ones that generate revenue. 
and they are looking at actually scaling it up in terms of adding clean cooking solutions and all that to their services. And this is something that can actually help, but I mean, we are not talking about the solutions. But in terms of the problems and the challenges, the non-existence of policies on the ground to be able to retool local governance or local governments to be able to take on such initiatives, it's, 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 it's the major issue. And so when there are initiatives such as clean cooking, it becomes a challenge in terms of whether you go with the local government, whether you go with the national government, or you just go with civil society organizations. So it's a bit murky in terms of how to accurately embed some of these solutions. Absolutely, yeah, definitely challenging to kind of know the roles of these different actors, who's gonna be most effective at addressing this with kind of the speed and scale that's so needed to really solve this problem. Um, and maybe back to you, Mercy, a little bit as well. I, I mean, a large part of the portfolio of Energy for Impact really focuses on cities. Um, why do you feel that clean cooking is so important in specifically an urban context? Oh, wow, that's a heavy one. <laughs> Um, yeah, uh, let me for just first of all to give a bigger picture of um, investments in um, the clean cooking space in Africa. Uh, globally, first of all, two billion, over two billion do not have access to clean cooking, yeah? Um, that's about a third, al almost a third of the global population. 900 million of these are in, in Africa, yeah? Um, so we need to do much more to drive that investment in. But aside from that, there are um, you know, various unique um, levels of why we also need to also think about the urban space, not just the rural space. Um, the world is becoming more and more urban. Um, at the moment, about over half of the population now lives in an urban uh, area. Um, and this is projected to rise to 70% of the population by 2030. Um, so we can safely say that the future is urban. Um, and most of this growth will be happening in Africa and in Asia where um, majority of the developing states um, are present, which means that resource uh, consumption will uh, is going to be skewed and will continue to grow in the urban space. So how we plan these urban, um, uh, these cities and urban agglomerations will determine the quality of our lives in the future and will also determine how our ability to address uh, some of the most challenging, um, I would say, issues that are affecting us at this age, climate change, environmental degradation, conflict, gender and social inclusion. So it is important to start thinking about how we, um, we plan for the urban future. Uh, the second point is people that live in the urban informal settlement, uh, that live in urban informal settlements. They are growing as the cities keep growing. So in Africa, for example, uh, the UN habitat estimates that about 59% of the population in sub-Saharan Africa lives in informal settlements. They are often isolated from basic uh, services, basic and quality services, which then exposes them to many more risks, environmental, economic, social. Um, it's not uncommon for us to hear of um, c communities or losses of lives or um, losses of property uh, as a result of certain um, risks um, in informal settlements. Just last year, uh, Mr. Abdul can attest that in one of the communities that we are working in, um, in Freetown, there was a fire. And um, lots of people lost their homes, people lost their properties. And, it, and when I say people, I mean hundreds uh, of families. And it was in the midst of COVID-19 in the midst of rainy season that always causes floods, till today they are still trying to recover. It is therefore very important that we also think about those marginalized and vulnerable communities in the urban space that are going to be left behind in, if nothing is done. Now, to put it in terms of numbers, um, in 2019, Energy for Impact wanted to estimate what this isolation means uh, 
as regards to energy access. And um, when looking at it more specifically in clean cooking, we came up with a number 192 million in Sub-Saharan Africa alone. This is the number of people that currently do not have access to clean cooking in the urban space. This is the number of people who will likely be missed if nothing is done. Um, and therefore, you know, when we talk about SDG 7 and universal energy access, these are, this is the number of people that will be missed by 2030. I should stress here that this is a high level estimation. Uh, the data here is quite limited, but we just wanted to quantify this and just try and understand how serious this, um, you know, situation is. So that is why it is quite important for us to really focus on cities, even as we're talking about the, um, the urban space. Um, maybe the final thing uh, is n not all is lost. I, I, I know the situation. I might have maybe made it, <laughs> you know, um, shown just how serious it is, but not all is lost. Cities present a really good canvas for um, testing and scaling clean cooking solutions. Um, first of all, the higher population densities enable, make it easier and, and cheaper to, to develop last mile distribution infrastructure. The social diversity of urban dwellers enables uh, companies and um, market players to test innovative clean cooking solutions against so various social and cultural uh, backgrounds, and therefore the solutions can work for s such a diverse, a diverse um, uh, population. And not to mention um, the opportunity that is there to de-risk some of these models given the varying levels of income um, you know, uh, among the, the population in the urban space. Uh, there's a general willingness and openness by people in urban spaces to test these technologies and just see how they would be useful not just to their lives but to also improving their economic status. So for example, using cooking for um, for income generation, and um, there, you know, urban areas are all always are, are often home to so many other market actors, uh, academia, uh, financial service providers, um, development finance institutions, development partners, and therefore mobilizing them, and um, you know, and coordinating between these players is relatively easier in the urban space. And of course, finally, and not least, um, the fact that cities, there is a political will uh, among the local governments, you know? We've, we've, we've seen what Freetown and Accra are doing, uh, and the idea that they are thinking about clean cooking um, as part of their climate action commitments is, such, is so promising. So when we bring all these things together and we just work in a coordinated and integrated way, there's so much more we can do uh, to improve access to clean cooking in urban spaces. Thank you. Um, I just want to add to Messi's point um, before uh, Nidako, please, can I? Yeah, um, so, so when you, in terms of the urbanization of African cities, um, I'm, I'm part of a research consortium um, um, that is looking at urban reform generally. And, and it's becoming, as I indicated earlier, it's becoming more informal than formal. But what we should be mindful is that as cities in Africa become more informal, it doesn't commensurate with the trajectory in terms of GDP growth. So what is m happening here is that you have cities swelling up but uh, the, the people who are living in the cities can't afford to live in the city. So you have people living in Accra, but living at the periphery of Accra because they can't afford the rent cost of living in central Accra. That's something we should. And again, in terms of the business models that are being introduced with regards to some of these interventions, it's important, it's imperative that we don't do business as usual. It's important to factor in this segregated income requirement and income structures and income, the landscape, to make sure that people who really need it can actually afford it. I mean, listening to the innovation financing, listening to quite a number of plenary sessions, 
the conversation is just sounds more like business as usual. It's about the risk. Yes, going into an informal settlement, there is risk. However, there are opportunities as well. So, in all this, yes, we might actually think, yes, informal settlement is dangerous to implement solutions in there, but there are opportunities. There are people who live in there. The reason why people are called citizens is because they live in a city. And we should not forget that. It's a really important point, and I think um, very much you know, Mercy highlighted some of the kind of the hard numbers, but also remembering that this is still about people, and you know this whole conversation needs to come back to people and how we're making these solutions affordable, accessible, really putting people at the heart of, of how we're designing solutions. Um, Ni, nee, I'll actually have you maybe kick off the, the kind of last question that I have for this whole panel, which is really about what your hope is for the future of cities, and maybe you can include kind of your your favorite solution that you're excited about as well? What would your recommendation be? But really, Ni, kind of what is your hope for the future of cities in this global clean cooking challenge that we're all gathered here today to, to talk about? Thank you. Um, so like Kweku rightly said, um, I share his sentiments as well that the solutions should be tailored towards the needs of the urban dwellers. I mean, if we're going to promote clean cooking in the urban areas, and we're going to look at I mean, the widespread of the population and also target each and then pro propose solutions for each category of people. Um, as, this, uh, as we came to this forum, I mean, I, I happened to go around the Expo grounds and um, I was introduced to one of the ethanol stoves, okay? So I was very interested and I committed to buy one. Now, that's what I told them, yes. It is something that's quite new here in Accra. Um, I bought one, and the refill point is close to my house. It's just about five minutes from where I live. But that's what I told them. I hope that they're not going to leave me hanging because I don't want to buy it now, and then maybe two months or three months down the line, I go to the refill point, and I do not get it. Yeah. So some of the solutions got to be sustainable. Um, so I'm thinking that we've got to tailor make the solution so that it fits the right people we want to use these, I mean, solutions, okay. Um, a lot of communities around here would like to use, or they use the LPG, it is quite, I mean, the use of it is quite high here in Ghana. But then for the peri-urban community and the marginalized communities within the city space, can they really afford it? Okay, those doing mass cooking. You go to all these local shop bars or local restaurants, um, they are using LPG on a scale, but beyond a certain limit, they are all using firewood. Those preparing the cane case, that the fixed smokers along the, the beaches, they are using firewood. It's, I, I guess it's because of its affordability. I mean, if we, we, put, we come with, with these clean cooking solutions, they got to be affordable so that the people within the communities can afford and buy them and use them. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. And maybe we'll, we'll just go along the line here. Over to you, Mercy. What is your hope for the future of cities? Okay, so uh, three things. <laughs> uh, one is I would very much like to see clean cooking as an integral part of the urban development agenda. So given how much it, we interact with this on a daily basis and how relevant it's, it is to helping us achieve the sustainable development goals all together, it's very important that we have that in mind. Um, the second thing is just to, to get a, an understanding that attaining universal uh, access is a co collaborative effort. We shouldn't, leave, we shouldn't just leave it to the private sector or the local governments to do it on their own. We need people, we need uh, academia for research, we need investors, we need development partners to all come together, band together, and uh, work towards a common goal. And of course, the third one, and just to, um, to echo what my colleague Ni here said, is that we shouldn't forget that these solutions are for the people. And therefore, it is very important that we um, 
move towards providing products and services that people want and need. And I like to use uh, um, uh, the four A's of market viability, where we are addressing awareness, we're addressing availability, we are addressing affordability and appetite as we talk about all these, um, you know, all this clean cooking solutions um, on there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marcy. Um, yeah, really important in the four A's, I think. We haven't really talked about that much <laughs> this, this week, but I think are really, really critical in thinking about how we're designing solutions. Um, Kweku, over to you. What is your hope for the future of cities? Um, my hope for the future of cities in Africa, um, I mean, I work in African cities, so it's, it's, it's to be able to build solutions that reflect us. Um, we've always been looking for solutions elsewhere and that has not worked um, for us and that is what, why we find ourselves in the kind of issues that we are currently grappling with. Um, when I talk about solutions that reflect us, um, solutions that are locally sourced, um, if we are building clean energy solutions, where is the fuel coming from? Can we source the lo fuel lo locally? In the event Russia and Ukraine chooses to fight again, can we still have our fuel without necessarily being dependent on imports? The technologies that are being used, um, is it possible we can actually develop them locally? Tapping into the youth that we have in terms of the labor market that is available. I mean, we have a continent with so much potential, um, yet unfortunately we are always looking elsewhere. So what I'm saying is the ecosystem um, for creating solutions should make sure that it's locally sourced, locally relevant, and reflective of the people who live within cities. Thank you. So much, and I really appreciate the shout out as well to youth. Youth, I think, very much in this urban context that we're talking about, um, such an untapped kind of resource and opportunity to really bring youth into into solutions. Um, there are many young people in cities and moving to cities constantly, so definitely something we need to think about. But over to you, Abdul. What's, what is your uh, hope for the future of cities? Yeah, um, looking at the trend of urbanization, rural urban. Most of the rural migrants come into cities are low income earners. And most of these low income earners, because they cannot afford the high cost of housing, they find themselves in slums. And they make sure that they are more closer to their source of income, which is very small. So if we want to address these problems, adapting to clean cooking, the idea is good using LPGs, but we should also think about another alternative source of energy that will meet the demand of these people. And also, and most importantly, proper planning. There is a lot of uncontrolled development in the African sub-region which has made it very difficult for us to adapt to climate change and also to mitigate climate change. Thank you. Wonderful. Honorable Mayor, what is your hope for the future of cities? Thank you very much. Uh, I'm really delighted for us having such an interesting conversa conversation intervention that will pave way for innovation, skill development, social and economic uh, development, good health, quick and quality air, and better environmental, which will go a long way to pave way also for complementing the sustainable, sustainable development goal and climate action. As a mother and as a mayor, I'm delighted that uh, we are having this important conversation. And I know that uh, this will translate into action, which will keep women and children safe, as I said, and improve the quality of air for all residents in the city. 
I also think that uh, particularly happy that when we integrate clean cooking fully into communities in both commercial and domestic um, domestic spaces, the transition will lead to the generation of jobs. We will work closely in partnership with stakeholders to increase clean cooking awareness, demand and supply, affordable and accessibility in contrib to contribute to achieving clean cooking for all in our municipality. Clean cooking is sustainable and I'm hopeful it will impact life globally and help make the world a better place to live. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Mayor. And I think this is a wonderful place for us to kind of close off this discussion, this message of hope, of action. Um, I, I won't kind of do my, my panelists injustice in trying to summarize, but I think we had some really important kind of key takeaways and recommendations, um, really making sure that the solutions that we're designing in cities are sustainable in the long run. We're not creating short-term solutions that just don't work in, in the long run. Really integrating clean cooking as a central component of the urban agenda encouraging actors to come together and work collaboratively, whether that's finance, whether that's national government, supporting local governments, really bringing those actors together. We had people first, user-centered design that was very much emphasized and looking at those four A's when we're, when we're designing solutions. And solutions that reflect the people that they're for, um, really developed locally, leveraging youth and local ecosystems uh, to really build and, and sustain and benefit from solutions directly. And then ultimately this message that, you know, this really is part of the larger sustainable development agenda. This is about people. Um, cities really do have this incredible potential of being so connected to the greatest density of people that there's just, there's so much to do and, and so much that cities can do in really leading the way on the clean cooking challenge. So I want to close it off here with a huge thank you to my panelists and thank you all so much as well for, for your attention over this last this last hour, I hope you've learned lots and, and take away these messages uh, throughout the rest of the forum and back home. So thank you everyone so much. Um, thank you everyone. Lunch will begin in about 15 minutes in the Papillon restaurant on the third floor as well as Shea George on the lobby floor and you'll have about an hour and a half. The next sessions will begin at 1.30. Thank you. <laughs>